For this session, we're going to hear from two folks who have been working in this whole field with regard to fuel cells for a lot of years, both of them. And we will first hear from Ruth Cox, who is Executive Director of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. And after Ruth speaks, we will then hear from Bob Rose, who is Executive Director of Breakthrough Technologies Institute. Ruth? Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here uh, in the audience. I'm going to actually talk about fuel cell uh, electric vehicles and the clean transportation portfolio. And Bob, I think, is going to focus a lot uh, more on some of the stationary um, and portable uh, applications for fuel cells. And um, I, I do want to make the point, though, that one of the most important things to take away from this uh, is that fuel cells and hydrogen are integral components to the clean energy portfolio. They enhance every other energy option we have. Um, they enhance the performance of renewables. You're able to take excess uh, wind or solar uh, power, to convert it into hydrogen, and use it to power vehicles or other applications. In the case of uh, fossil fuels, which are going to be with us for at least another century, um, you can uh, process them more efficiently uh, and without uh, negative environmental impacts. And um, in the case of uh, dis distributed generation in general, it's more reliable, it's uh, more efficient, and ultimately it's going to be more cost effective. So um, it's really important to know that it, we're not, we don't operate in isolation. We operate in the context of uh, an emerging energy network, and we have a very important role to play, very much like a Cisco server has uh, in a telecommunications network. Um, I think the other uh, important point to make is that the transport sector in particular, because it contributes so much to um, our uh, dependence on foreign oil and on uh, you know, the, uh, generating uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other, uh, uh, net, you know, harmful emissions. Um, in order for us to meet our goals, our energy security goals, our national security goals, our economic uh, development goals, as well as our environmental goals, um, fuel cells and fuel cells and hydrogen, fuel cell electric vehicles must be part of the clean transportation portfolio. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take McKinsey and Company's word for it or the National Academies of Science and many other very esteemed organizations that have already come to this conclusion and published such findings. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, if we're really serious about getting off of foreign oil, you're not going to be able to do it with batteries alone. You're not going to be able to do it with just batteries and biofuels. Fuel cell electric vehicles need to be part of that mix. The third point I'd like to make is that refueling infrastructure is on the critical path. Without putting hydrogen refueling infrastructure in place for the transport industry, you're not going to sell cars. And if you look at um, our uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Japan, Korea, Germany, China, um, we are falling behind. We used to be ahead. We were the leader in this industry. And um, because of the shift in uh, administration and, and um, you know, we've been, uh, what's the word, not embraced um, by uh, Secretary Chu, um, for all the wrong reasons, or for false reasons, um, we're now falling behind. So Germany is committed to 1,000 refueling stations in, uh, by 2017. Uh, Japan, 100 refueling stations by 2015. They're talking about 2 million fuel cell electric vehicles on the road by 2025. Korea doing something very similar, and China's doing a lot. They're just not talking about it to us. So um, what that does is it disadvantages the American automakers. So GM, which has invested $2, two billion plus dollars in their uh, development of their fuel cell electric vehicle, is not going to be able to compete as effectively as Honda and Toyota and Hyundai and Daimler uh, because in their countries they're building infrastructure and they're going to sell cars and they're going to drive the cost curve down. And, you know, it disadvantages American companies. So American competitiveness in general is at stake because of what's happening right now. And it's not just the funding uh, cuts that we've received. It's the rhetoric. It's the lack of understanding of the fundamental role that fuel cells and hydrogen play in our clean energy portfolio that are, are um, giving negative signals to the investors, negative signals to manufacturers, and negative signals to uh, end users. And uh, we need to turn that around. Now, we've had great support from Congress, and we really appreciate it. And we're going to have to continue to call on their support. Uh, and I'm hopeful, um, you know, that we're going to achieve um, some big successes in the near future and take the, our rightful place in the clean energy portfolio. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jerry. Bob, take it away. Thank you.
Thanks very, thanks very much. Uh, I want to focus uh, today on, on one of the uh, misperce misperceptions that uh, surrounds uh, the fuel cell industry, and that's the misperception that, the, uh, that this is a, uh, an industry that's focused uh, primarily or almost exclusively on research and that products are a long way away. Uh, the fuel cell industry is a billion dollar industry today. Uh, it has, uh, and it's on a tremendous growth path. I was at a meeting uh, earlier this week with a, uh, a company, an, an international company, that, that told us that they were planning on shipping their one millionth fuel cell next year. So this is not a technology that's in the, in the distant future. This is a technology that's finding market traction today. Admittedly, it's, it's finding tra uh, traction primarily in niche markets, but every technology as it emerges from the laboratory goes for the same thing. Those of us who, who, uh, uh, who are old enough remember the, a time when you couldn't get a, uh, a solar-powered pocket calculator. Now I think every single uh, calculator available, including those you get free, has a, has a little solar cell on it. So it's, it's natural for technologies to start there. And while these may be niche markets, they're huge markets. Uh, you know, the, the uh, advanced energy industry is a $240 billion marketplace. So. Uh, fuel cells don't need a very good percentage to do pretty well, and, 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 and as we're seeing with uh, solar and wind, and wind power particularly, those, uh, that market traction is producing profits. The U.S. does have the lead at, um, in uh, combined heat and power systems for uh, uh, fuel cell combined heat and power systems and in goods movement. Uh, 80 megawatts of combined heat and power shipped uh, last year, thousands of forklifts of all kinds shipped last year. Backup systems for telecom, emergency, and uh, military, and other uh, high-value uh, commercial applications, and and it it it, is, it isn't just glorified science projects. Uh, companies like Google and eBay, Wegmans, Walmart, Sprint, Verizon, Motorola, IKEA, Staples. Uh, the list goes on and on. And if you want to see uh, you want to see how those companies are doing and what they're reporting themselves, not me, but what the companies who are using fuel cells are reporting, you can. Uh, uh, see a, pick up a copy of this online at fuelcells.org, which we are proud to, uh, to be the host of, a business case for fuel cells. If you're interested in what your states are doing, and there's a tremendous amount of activity in the states, you can pick up the, our brand new State of the States report. And if you want to take a peek at the economics of the fuel cell industry and the status of, uh, of the major fuel cell markets, this is a Department of Energy product, the 2010 uh, fuel cell market report. Uh, the other thing I think it's important to remember in fuel cells is that, uh, uh, is that the U.S. has a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous patent position in fuel cells. We are by far the largest uh, uh, um, uh, patent issuing country uh, for fuel cell technologies. Forty-seven percent of the fuel cell patents uh, between 22, 2002 and 2010 were U.S. patents. And that is a, there is a, is a huge gap between the, the number of fuel cell patents issued in those years compared to solar and wind, maybe perhaps a thousand fuel cell patents overall. It's, it's also a, a, an industry that employs 10,000 Americans, and there's a tremendous amount of growth, in, in, particularly in, uh, in uh, companies in the combined heat and power world. Uh, I think we can conservatively estimate 25 percent growth uh, in U.S. jobs in the course of the next year alone. Uh, in short, I, I, I hope I've convinced you that this is a, a technology or a family of technologies that, that can't be ignored and shouldn't be ignored. Uh, but it's not to say that the job is done. I think it, uh, every one of the advanced uh, energy technologies that carries uh, uh, public benefits in terms of efficiency, security, uh, and in the case of, I, I think, increasingly the case with fuel cells and others, uh, return on investment for those people who buy them. Uh, a partnership with the government is a, is, a, is a crucial piece of it, particularly in these formative years when, uh, uh, when mar we're just getting a toehold in these markets. Uh, there are a number of pieces of legislation uh, 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 introduced in the Congress. That's really the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association's uh, uh, piece of business, so you can uh, certainly check with them on the specifics of it. But there's plenty of opportunities to get involved in this on the policy side, both in, uh, in terms of uh, larger policy issues such as renewable energy standard and in terms of more specific issues such as uh, tax support for fuel cell deployments. So with that. Uh, Great. Thanks a lot. And I, um, I think that was the, there were a lot of important points there and uh, a couple things that, that I personally have always thought were 
very valuable with regard to fuel cells is that they are modular. You know, there are a lot of applications in terms of stationary as well as thinking about uh, in terms of transportation, but also they are quiet. Um, they don't produce emissions. Uh, you get some water out of it. And the and another thing, uh, as we hear more and more in terms of the need for reliability and resilience with regard to the grid, you will find that uh, companies who are absolutely uh, reliant upon not having any interruption in high quality power, that you're going to find fuel cells there to help make sure that they do have that kind of reliability. So as, as Bob was also saying, you know, it's important for us all to remember how all of these technologies actually mutually really support and reinforce each other and it's important to think about these synergies and how it all gets married together in these blended and hybrid systems. And that is a really, really exciting piece that makes all of this actually fun. So thank you very, very much. And now, and please, you know, make sure to follow up and see these booths. And now we're going to move to the next panel. So thank you all for hanging in. Thank you.